So obviously, in a year full of bad news, the world of professional wrestling got some more bad news to kind of put a bow on this year of 2020. With the passings of legend Danny Hodge and the untimely surprise passing of Jonathan Huber, better known as Brody Lee in AEW or Luke Harper from his WWE days. And wanted to make sure I took some time to talk about both of these men, uh, their accomplishments, their significance, and their legacy. This is bad news. <laughs> right around Christmas, too. Stick that in your stocking and smoke it, huh? Oh, Lord Almighty. Uh, now, I'll talk first about Danny Hodge because, you know, there's also some personal stories there involving him. But uh, a lot of you that might be watching this might not be that familiar with Danny Hodge or might not know much about him or may have heard the name, might have a cursory understanding of who he is. But Danny Hodge was a legit dude, a legit badass, frankly, into his freaking 80s. You know, dude made it until the age of 88, so that's to say something. But here's a guy back in his younger days. He was a high school state champion in amateur wrestling. He was also a three-time NCAA champion, I believe. He went on to become a two-time Olympian a silver medalist at the 1956 Melbourne Australia Olympic Summer Olympics. Uh, so when you talk about amateur wrestling, you know he certainly had the credentials. I believe still to this day, not only is he the first, but he's the only amateur wrestler to ever have been featured on the cover of Sports Illustrated. No small feat for sure. Um, and he was a guy that had dabbled with boxing at one point in time. You know, even hearing him talk about it in person years later, back in 2012. You know, he had some thoughts about, you know, was he going to try and go for both wrestling and boxing in the 1960 Rome Olympics? It was something that he had considered for a period of time. Uh, so the type of dude that was absolutely legit, the type of dude that you would not question his toughness or his ability to whoop your ass, because he absolutely positively could. And he had a relatively lengthy wrestling career, was a certain level of star uh, in the Midwest. I think he was a multiple-time a junior heavyweight champion in the NWA. You know, he was making close to six figures at a time where that was really big money in the world of professional wrestling in the old NWA and territorial days. How about many of you probably have heard of him as much as anything else for being the guy that could sit there and squash an apple with his bare hands. And I can attest to the fact that in 2012, I saw an 80-year-old Danny Hodge do this in person at the Dan Gable Museum in Waterloo, Iowa, as part of that Tragos uh, Thuz Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame weekend. It was part of a Saturday morning amateur wrestling claim that was put on that was like the beginning of the day's festivities. And, and Danny Hodge sat there with an apple in his hand, age 80, and he smashed it. Like, not two hands, just one hand. He was still able to do it, just fascinating. You know, being able to get some interaction with Danny Hodge in person, was able to interview him. I don't think I ever really ran it on the show uh, back in the day because he was such a soft talker that you couldn't hear him. And, you know, obviously we didn't have mics or anything, which we should have. But um, being able to talk to him and, you know, hear him tell some stories and talk about his time in wrestling and, you know, a wonderful man, a sweet man, a very humble man. Like, to me, Danny Hodge is a great example of, um, in today's world, you've got so many wannabe tough guys and wannabe badasses. Hey, work out in my local MMA dojo. You want to mess with me, I'll mess you up. You know, the wannabe badass. The one that's got to tell everybody how tough they are. Whereas the real tough guys, the real badasses, like the Hakus of the worlds and the Danny Hodges of the worlds, they don't have to talk about how tough they are. They are. Everybody else does it for them. That's when you know a dude is legit. That's when you know a dude is tough as hell. And I can tell you personally, from at the age of 80, being at the receiving end of him demonstrating a professional and amateur headlock and surviving that and surviving his handshake and feeling like your bones were crunching in your hand, uh, even in his 80s, an octogenarian, I wouldn't want to mess with that dude. 
is tough as hell. My memory serves me correctly. You know, he even talked a little bit about it. Was when a car accident back in the day, and he had a broken neck, and he had went into the water when his during his car accident, and he had to get himself out of the car with a broken neck and hold his neck in place and come to the surface. Like that's how tough of a dude Danny Hodge was. And I think it's a shame in a bit of a way that he was in the time that he was where a lot of younger wrestling fans really honestly don't know much about him. Almost a shame in a sense that he's one of those somewhat forgotten names and that absolutely should not be the case. Like You should do yourself a favor if you care about the history of professional wrestling, have a passion for the history of wrestling, you know, both professional and maybe even amateur. You should definitely look up the story, the life, and the career of Danny Hodge um, because lots of fascinating material there for sure. Um, I know personally, again, being able to speak with him in person and meet him in person was truly an honor. Um, wonderful, sweet, humble guy. Uh, really didn't like to talk much about himself and how great he was. Like Even when we were there, it was a JR or a Briscoe or a Lou Thez's widow, Charlie Thez, getting him to talk about the things that he had done and, and so forth. Like Truly awesome experience. And I could tell you this, like one, one of the most exciting things I've ever experienced in person, on TV, whatever the case might be, as part of anything associated with professional wrestling, was back again at that 2012 Hall of Fame weekend. And the main event was this kind of um, Legends Lumberjack match. So you have like Danny Hodge and you have Dan the Beast Severn and you have uh, Baron Von Raschke and all these legends of the past and professional wrestling surrounding the ring. And then the heels get fed out. It was after, I believe, a ref bump spot. And the, one of the heels gets in Danny Hodge's face. And Danny Hodge hits him with that stiff work punch. And the place exploded. The Five Sullivan Brothers Convention Center in Waterloo, Iowa. You probably had maybe 500 people, 600 people in there at most. But it sounded, it popped. The pop was so loud when you were there in person. It felt like you were in a in an arena a stadium that sat five or ten thousand people. I'm not just giving you hyperbole to pump up a dude because he's gone now. Like it was legit. Like seeing him pop the dude, that place erupted, and then Baron von Rasch could put him in the claw. Like those are just the types of memories that you experience that you just you just can't do justice. Like truly awesome. So you know, certainly. A sad day, uh, lived a full life, lived a hell of a life, that's for sure. Um, but still, tough news to hear about the passing of Danny Hodge at the age of 88. Uh, on the other hand, when you talk about Jonathan Huber, you know, 41 is a young age to pass. Hey, I, I, obviously, this is a surprise. And I've seen other people asking about it like, it's a valid question. Like, when's the last time we had somebody like in a North American wrestling company that was active? When was the last time somebody of any note uh, passed away while they were active? Was it Benoit? Like, that's how infrequently this really happens. So, it's not surprising to see the shock, the emotion, the sadness that have poured out from uh, wrestling companies. Different wrestlers, talent in the business, people in the business, fans, the marks outside of the business, like everybody. Yeah, it was surprising news, tragic news. Uh, 41, and reportedly due to some non-COVID-related lung issue. That's young. That's really, really young. And thinking about that, at the age of 41, like, that's supposed to be midlife. That's when... You're supposed to be just really at the peak of your life in a lot of ways and truly starting to enjoy your life. And he had his ultimately snuffed out the day after Christmas. Man, that, that, that sucks. And it sucks for so many people in professional wrestling. You've seen the emotion being poured out today. Uh, the number of people that lost a friend, a family member, like... It's tough for a lot of folks. And my heart certainly goes out to his wife, we've been married to for over a decade, his two sons, 
that now will have to continue to grow up and go through the rest of their life without their loving, caring, devoted father. It's an important reminder that life is not fair. And frankly, sometimes life just really sucks. And, and I look at the passing here of a Jonathan Huber and I say, you know, like a lot of us, we talk about well, Luke Harper died or Brody Lee died. And it's like, you know, we, we lose a little bit of our humanity when we talk about bottom like that. Because um, we're just talking about the wrestling character. It's just like a wrestler died. And it was way more than that. But you, know, you think about a couple of different things here. And that is number one, like sometimes we get so focused when we're talking about wrestling, how guys don't have that or don't have it or they're not main event material and blah, 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 blah. And we forget that for so many of these guys and gals that go into a business like wrestling, where the percentage of chance of success is incredibly small, that not only did Mr. Huber enjoy some success, he enjoyed quite a bit of success. He was able to pursue a passion, a lifelong dream that, oh, so many of us only wish that we had the courage to even do. He did it. And if I must say, all things factored in, he did a damn good job of it. Like, he spent over a decade working on himself and honing his craft and his skills in different areas around the country and around the world, working the independent scenes before he finally got signed to the WWE. I believe it was back to 2012 when he first came into NXT and, you know, went on to become an NXT tag team champion. Later on down the road, part of the Wyatt family, a multiple-time tag team champion, I think on SmackDown, intercontinental champion. This is a guy that was able to work pay-per-views, be a part of main event angles, was able to be a part of multiple WrestleManias. You know, he did all of that before the age of 40. That is pretty damn impressive. And sometimes we get so caught up on the bullshit, frankly, that we forget that some of these people can really serve as inspirations for us in our everyday lives and role models for us in our everyday lives and can set a wonderful example that we should be working to follow. A guy that treated others around him very well. A guy who could continue to work and hone his skills and hone his craft and get better year by year, day by day, week by week, month by month, blah, 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 all the cliche stuff. It's true. He got to the big show. And even once it finally, you know, kind of came to an end in WWE and he was ultimately kind of sent packing, he didn't give up on his dream. He adjusted the goals and he adjusted his mindset and he went to AEW and admittedly there in a relatively short amount of time enjoyed some success. He was a TNT champion and a lot of fans gave good feedback on him and the character and the work that he was doing. It was frankly kind of surprising once he lost the title to Cody Rhodes that we hadn't seen him again on television, which at the time he really didn't think anything of it, but maybe, you know, now without knowing all the details, and frankly, I don't know that we need to know all the details, um, it makes you wonder that, you know, it's probably something we wish we would have uh, appreciated more, like looking back. But man, like... A short time on earth, really. 41 years is a very short time. But yet he accomplished so much. And probably still had plenty of things that he wanted to accomplish. And most of that, probably as much as you could say that was wrestling related, I'm sure certainly there were things wrestling related that he wanted to achieve. Uh, but probably the biggest milestones that he had left in his life to achieve were family related. Like being there for his two sons and being able to see them grow up and to develop into young men and Watch them graduate high school, perhaps graduate college, and go on to have families of their own. And, and it's very sad that Mr. Huber is not going to be able to experience any of that. Like, that sucks. It is a great reminder of the fact that life is not fair. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone. As Steve Jobs once said, I believe, to kind of paraphrase, a line from his 2005 Stanford commencement address, uh, you know, the greatest motivation that I have is that I know tomorrow is not promised to me. I, I kind of butcher what he said, but you get the point. Like, he, death is the greatest motivator in life. 
because nothing is truly promised and you don't know what could happen from one day to the next. Like, think about how surprised we all, we're all were to see this December 26, 2020, 41-year-old man who you thought was in the peak of his life, the peak of his career, you know, he's now gone. It's also a good reminder for us to not only live the creed and the motto, live by it, of live every day to the fullest. Get the most out of your life. Live today like it is the last day of your life because the one thing you know is that you don't know if it is or is not. So live today. Live the day that you're watching this video. Live every single day for the rest of your life like it's the last day on earth for you. And think about what you're doing and is that what you want to be doing in your last day on the planet. Now you have to have that type of urgency to it. And seeing an unfortunate, tragic death like this at such a young age is a perfect reminder of that. Perhaps it's also a good reminder too, like in a, in a, in a year with so much adversity for so many millions of folks and so much bad news out there for so many people, it's an important reminder to you know keep perspective and not always be so easy and quick to judge people. I know we live in a world where that's natural. We live in a world that that's unfortunately the reality of where we are. But you, know, you think about this, like if this was a long running issue, and again, we don't know. And again, I don't know that we need to know the details. It's almost better that we don't. I'm sure eventually they will come out. We'll get more specifics. Um, but you never know what he was dealing with. Like he could have been dealing with a major issue, whether it was a cancer or some other type of lung-related issue or some other type of physical malady or ailment the entire time that he was TNT champ, which if anything, going back and looking at it, makes what he did even more impressive and more respectable and more admirable. So it's a perspective, perhaps, a reminder for all of us, you know, to remember that we don't know what shit somebody else may be going through. And sometimes those people may indeed manifest themselves in ugly, nasty, vicious ways. And it is very tempting and very easy sometimes to, to respond in kind. And you can feel like they deserve it. But maybe it is a good reminder to uh, be a little bit kinder, a little bit better to your fellow man or woman because you don't really know what's going on with, on the other side. You really don't know what's going on with that other person. Um... Yeah. And I think the other thing in hearing about Mr. Huber's passing is, you know, treasure who you have in your life that brings you value. Make sure that they know every single day how much they mean to you. Take nothing for granted. Leave nothing to chance. Because again, you don't know from one day to the next if you'll be there or if they'll be around anymore. You don't want to live your life with any regrets. And, I, and I'm, I'm saying this as a kind of a personal thing too. Like I've lived my life so far with a lot of regrets. And when I hear about passings like Jonathan Huber's, I say, crap, he was 41. I'm 39. A few months away from 40. Like this is the type of shit that really scares me. Because that's the thing that makes you feel your mortality a more, lot more than you really want to. And you can't really live your life in fear, I understand. And you never know what could happen from one day to the next, but that's the type of stuff that terrifies me. And you think about your legacy and you think about, you know, what would people say about you when you're gone? And I would hope that I could be the type of person someday, and I'm not, admittedly, I'm not, I'm absolutely not. I wish I was, but I'm not. I wish I could be the type of person that could have the love and outpouring and support that a Jonathan Huber got at the time of his passing. But how great and awesome would it have been for him to be able to see that while he was still alive? You know what I mean? That's not anybody's fault. Like, it's human nature. We take these things for granted. And we don't prioritize what we should. And I can say even within my own very types of personal relationships, um, even times where I've been right in my thought process or times where I'm wrong, it really doesn't matter. Like, if it really doesn't matter then don't let it matter. Let that shit go, man. Let that shit go. I cannot tell you how much more fulfilled of a life you could lead if you do that. 
So if you've got people that you love, that love you back, that you legitimately value, that value you, make sure you live your life in part to let them know how much they mean to you on a consistent basis. Do not be like me. Be like a Jonathan Huber. Look to his example. Pursuing a dream. Going after it with everything in his being. But still being well-rounded enough and balanced enough to be decent and kind to his fellow talents. His fellow wrestlers. The fans. Just the people in general. Like a guy who made it big to a degree because he absolutely did. When you're appearing on national television week after week for years, you've made it big. And sometimes we de-emphasize that when it comes to wrestling. Like, it's a big effing deal to be able on national primetime cable television to have a spot where you can appear for years. Like, that's a big deal. And still be humble enough to not think your shit don't stink and to sit there and treat people well around you like, that's a really good indication of the quality of individual, of human being, of man that uh, Brody Lee was. Um, and we should aspire to be like that. And it's similar to the Shag Gaspar passing earlier in the year. Like, it's a reminder to, you know, live each day to the fullest. So my condolences to the friends and families of both Danny Hodge and Jonathan Huber. You know, Danny Hodge lived a hell of a life, and that's something we should aspire to be like. Uh, but so did Brody Lee. He lived a hell of a life. And unfortunately, he probably had a lot of great years left ahead of him, both in wrestling and, more importantly, as a husband and family man. And he won't get to experience that now. Uh, but we can strive to live up to the example that he set, that's for sure.